Do you make the sunset? Do you make the bright stars flee? Old crow, time is getting late I know you can gift for me Old bird, I see it in your talons Glittering between the leaves And I'm swimming in the shallows You're calling from the deep And we bite our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky And we bite our time Welcome back to the School of Applied Neopeasantry. You've been listening to the beautiful voice and instrumentations of Glenn Dunn, covering a song called Crow by the English band Tongue, the raven of which is Trickster, communication spirit in Jarrah Mother Country from where we live, labour and love. Today's guests are Jen Ridley and Uncle Charles Davison, Aboriginal wisdom holders and dear friends from up north. Well, thank you, Jen and Charles, for joining us on our podcast today. It's great to have you in our home. Thank you. Good. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'd like to start with a, a simple question. Uh, maybe start with you, Jen. What's home for you? Home? That's not For me, it's not a, a structure. It's who I'm closest to. Mm-hmm. Um, my children, family, uh, partner, um, wherever we are as a collective, we're at home together. And that space can change when we're on the road like we are now. Um, just being together and being in each other's space and connecting is home for me. Mm. Mm. I have a sensory alignment with place, um, but as a priority, it's the space that I share with others. Mm. Mm. I'm not too sure if I'm too much different. You know, mm. home. You know, when you think about it, sometimes you think, you know, is home where you were born. You know, is home you know, in, in places where you might have lived for some time? Or is it, you know, where you are now and with your your family? And I think, you know, um, home is where we are. But I think that's, uh, for me, it's home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, so we um, made a video together in 2020 we just started to get to know you was it that long ago yeah Mm. i think you guys reached out and introduced yourselves and Mm. we got to hear a bit of your story and then we invited you to tell more of that very interested to hear about your experiences as aboriginal publishers people working in education and health Mm. uh, and in various Mm. cultural and community settings over many years. Um, Many children and grandchildren and extended family and brought in family, gathered Mm. in family, collected family. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Yeah, and so any of the listeners, I um, will leave a a link to that first conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm, good. And then we travelled into the bowels of COVID and 2021 and the ongoing um, disruption to everybody's lives and, mm. um, and connected very strongly in that space um, mm. with where your values were and 
where ours were and have developed deeper connections and relations and and now you're teaching on the same permaculture design course as we are, we're guests like yourself on David Holmgren and Beck Lowe's permaculture design course and that feels right and timely um, to have your perspectives not representing Aboriginal perspectives universally, but representing your mm. perspectives as Aboriginal people. Mm. Um, and we got to hear and sit in on your session yesterday, which was incredibly moving, and I'd like to talk a little more about that and draw out a little more yeah. from you. But before we get there, I just, in terms of where we first met, and in many respects, 2020 was full of hope and there was a lot of people at home with time a lot of people reaching out to us and we were making videos how to a lot of how to videos before it got intensely personal and political and mm. yes. um, but now where we are in 2023 um, what are some of the biggest challenges you and your family face right now as Aboriginal people? For me, I've, I've felt the last few years that we're this, we've been as a family, as an mm. Aboriginal family, a large, with a large extended family. It, it was a very reactionary mm. couple of years to currently now be listening to the narrative um, in the lead up to the state election where we have a Premier who's saying that whilst he wasn't premiered during the height of what is referred to as the pandemic, um, he's now saying in the lead up in the week, few days before the election, that there are no, no mandate in, in his conceptualization of the now um, and he wasn't responsible. Well, that's actually not of relevance to me. The more relevance is actually looking back and wanting to actually deeply understand how and who did make these decisions mm -hmm. that impacted on so many lives. Mm -hmm. And then our, our response to those reactions, I think was quite different because we saw words that were created into a sentence or statement that became known as a mandate as, as very simply open for interpretation. So for us as a family with high needs to support our children and grandchildren and our elderly parents, well, this is the wording as a reactionary um, action, but it's not applicable to us. Mm. Our parents still need connection. Our grandchildren need to be cared for irrespective of whether their parents are working at home online, mm. it, it wasn't in our way of being to see that the, the young children, highly dependent children, would go without appropriate care. Mm. And so our response was quite carefully thought out mm. on how we would remain connected as a, a family, to remain strong on actually, yeah, responding to that. We were forced into a position mm. where the primary uh, source of our, of our family income, um, in the words, again words, was you can no longer work for X. So our alternatives were to not sit back and contemplate too much about the words but to actually make what we could then continue to actually apply to the levels of our family and extend and extended community around us mm -hmm. so the time that you were prevent you are now prevented from you know coming to the workplace you are now prevented mm -hmm. from going and shopping at your local shopping center mm -hmm. i think our um, true response as opposed to reaction was to 
in a quite e- easy manner, deconstruct what wasn't in alignment with our way of living anyway. Mm. And we were already in some way had a readiness for a more self-instructional type of way of being. Mm. And some people would say, oh, did you defy mandates? Did you, you know, did you run rogue? We didn't even see it like that. Mm. Essentially, it was about ensuring that relationships and people's well-being who were close to us were well looked after. Mm. Mm. And there was no need in our way of being to discriminate any difference. Mm. But but it's sort of, I I guess when I think about 2019, when I can remember changing offices and, uh, you know, how that new office was structured and how they were putting in place how we might work, actually the introduction of uh, working from home for a couple of days a week. Coming into 2020, and of course, the world changed. There's rules and regulations, everyone's got to wear masks, and I've got, you know, suffer with asthma. So I wasn't going to sit on the train for an hour and a half wearing a mask. So I was happy to, okay, do the three days at, uh, at home, but it's a couple of days at work. Um, but then even those restrictions came in place. Can't meet. You know, without wearing masks, you can't do this and can't do that. So how am I going to manage this? But there was a lot of other uh, decisions that were made too that uh, was going to impact on me in my role. Mm. Um, And up until until that time, I thought, you know, well, you know, even now, I think, you know, if those restrictions weren't put in place, I probably would be still working. Mm. But then maybe, maybe it's time that I'm, you know, I did retire, Mm -hmm. you know, but it wasn't on my terms. Mm -hmm. It was on somebody else's terms. However, um, today I feel it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. When you talk about, ask that question, home, well, now I'm at home. I am at home all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm not disconnected every two or three days or every day from my family and going off somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It gave us, you know, times when I suppose we could be angry. Mm -hmm. Angry because of how it impacted on not only us, but broader community and people that we actually worked for or with. with. As Aboriginal people who are well across and have seen in your own generations and you know the history of Mm -hmm. colonisation. Were there any parallels to what you saw happen in your in your generations in your with your people and the COVID response? Like did did that Mm -hmm. was that triggering at all for you? Well I think that the triggering nature of it was and a relative said, isn't it curious? Us blackfellas are never first in line. We're always at the back of the line with everything else. Mm. But this time around, we're first and centred. What do you reckon that's about? What I, I observed um, was so um, escalated emotionally um, of fear, the mm. implantation of fear, the implantation of you are, as an Aboriginal family, um, you're, you're so disadvantaged. And it reminded me similarly to many years ago, prior to dis, you know, really disassociating with any form of institutionalised uh, schooling or education for our children. But when we had approached a school and we were in conversation with a principal, and after the pleasantries of hello, how are you going? The first and foremost thing the principal said was, I just really want to assure you both that I'm quite aware and therefore skilled at being able to access disadvantaged program monies that will be able to direct towards your children. And my re- re- you know, my immediate feeling to being imposed on like that was, 
my my children are unknown to you. Mm. Please don't speculate mm. that so. that yeah. they're they're disadvantaged mm. are you, uh, by by tainting them in a way that their identity mm. is is mm. to their disadvantage. Yeah. We're raising our children and constructing our foundations of our family and our yeah. relationships in that, mm. building strength and resilience, yeah. not exacerbating yeah. disadvantage. Had we already not been in that situation, had we not already had the huge amount of work and community-based project experience, a lot of experience in program management and in... Uh, the way you know governments and institutionalized spaces work, our experience in the last three years would have been much different. Yeah. So I I see for us that pre actual con our home based or family based conditioning to respond to that mm. really set us in a good space. Mm. But going back to what you asked about being all of a sudden declared as an as an Aboriginal person who, in Charles's case, had worked uh, for over 40 years as a public servant, to then be told, you can no longer work. Mm -hmm. The response really, after the initial, again, you know, the initial just like shock of it, was, well, that's okay, in essence, and the total nature of it for us is, we can't work with you either. Yeah. yeah. So it didn't. It didn't actually have a monetary focus. Mm. No. It had a. We have our integrity. Mm. We have our situational space that we can make of what is our choosing. Mm. But actually, the news for you as as those authoritative pillars, whether they be government or community, mm. all actually are. Uh, Operate, operate in the same way we actually don't need you yeah mm. and that, that level of the severing of relationships as you say you know, mm. with you Charles 40 years of service as an Aboriginal representative within mm. New mm. South Wales government the severing of so many relationships the, mm. the, the clearing mm. out of the heterodoxy out of universities mm. the clearing out of people out of the education and medical systems who uh, had a different um, scientific or uh, social approach to mm. to COVID um, because if you didn't fit the one size fits all narrative um, right. you would be basically um, being turfed out but that is a very good point Jen that yes that's exactly how we feel it's like yeah we can no longer work with you either mm -hmm. at the same time as this severing of connection there is has been this incredible growing of connection mm -hmm. and strengthening of relations with those that we can form yeah. relations and that's been a very a part of the gift for us in of COVID. yeah but I, I think is for me i suppose um all those years of providing what I was employed for, advice from a cultural perspective, guidance in terms of where we should be going, whether it's varying programs or how we relate and communicate with the, uh, the community, yeah. was really set aside. We don't need um, that anymore. What got me was, we know what's best for you, mm. attitude. Yeah. We know what's best for the Aboriginal community attitude yeah. and for me it just sort of gone back to okay this is the government 150 years ago mm. putting in place the Aborigines Protection Board and all mm. that came with that mm. we will control and we will uh, uh, determine your outcomes my cultural beliefs and views were not important mm. at they that were, time. They were disregarded. Mm. And, and the irony of that disregard was that that actual facet of you being, being sought for those senior positions, the premise of that headhunt was that you were seen by all players as a cultural cultured person mm. 
And that is why you were sought for those positions because of that cultural mm. aspect mm. and your capacities and abilities, strengths and skills, but with something that became a very reactionary response and let's not, let's, you know, just make these snap decisions. Mm. That one facet that had held you in those positions for 40 years went to the bottom mm. of the regard yeah. pile. Yeah. And so the irony was that, in my mind, that your cultured way of being that had seen you to living almost beyond the average age of an Aboriginal male in this country as it mm. is, but yet still working, still active, still healthy and mm. everything else, that imposition actually completely disregarded that one facet that had held the space for 40 mm. years. Mm. And that's why I think my, my, my way of being with it was, we don't actually need that. Mm. Be- and my, my reasoning is that the suffocation of that type of relationship isn't is no longer about connection that's a form of abuse mm. Mm. abuse of power but a, abuse of circumstance mm. Mm. how can how can something circumstantial be yeah. such a trigger mm. for change mm. yeah. we didn't wait you know the, the collective didn't wait the collective had no understanding the the collective was misinformed we we didn't actually see a a truthful dialogue. We mm. impose. Mm. There was this general imposition on thought. Mm. There was an imposition through mainstream media and other media outlets, um, very specific media outlets that a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians um, associate with and have a connection for. It was very obvious from the onset that those were the gearing mechanisms mm. to promote what was the reaction mm-hmm. and in my own belief it it didn't avail the individual the family and the community time and space and, mm-hmm. and as a, as cultured centered relational people it's not our way of doing things in mm-hmm. a quick we're going it's going to mm-hmm. snap and change like this mm-hmm. cultured spaces are ever evolving and you can't shift a culture like that in in such a severed way mm. let alone actually whilst you sever the way of being mm. that what you're severing is the cultured aspect of it mm. and so that's how we really felt that as as a family and yeah. as a partnership mm. Charles and I are our instrumentally strong partnership mm. never doubted that the severing of a cultured way of being was not anybody else's to have a decision on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, yeah. it was just then a given how we then actually respond to the economic side of it. Yeah. We had always at the forefront was our culture and the integrity by which we had, and I feel, feel that in you know gratitude we had actually that well practiced before mm. Mm. us as a family and even individually we we're exposed to it mm. um, yeah. and I'm worried in a way that those processes of natural evolution for everybody not mm. not just um, us as an Aboriginal family are mm. being compromised mm. you look at the number of community organizations that have at a, at a small localised level that have been um, impacted mm. by these last three years. Mm. And I, I worry for many who so relied on uh, localised community support mm. for, for their family or individual situation, how those people mm. um, have been left, left mm. too. I, there's a few things in that. I, something that I'm sitting with is David Hongren recently saying, if only we had scientists working on an inoculation against fear That's right. mm. and propaganda, then we may have had a much more mm. uh, integrated and community-wide response and bottom-up response. Because I think this is the 
the ultimate political hubris from the from the left saying it has to be a we approach and a we approach will hand over to the controllers. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Rather than it has to be a we approach, we need to speak in our communities what that we will be. Mm. And and so this hubris of the left to think that communitarianism is handing over to Pfizer and Co. Right. and Fauci. Yeah. The CDC and the FDA, these completely captured institutions and our governments and the TGA just following behind mm. without any kind of curiosity, mm. without yeah. any scientific integrity. Mm. So, and the way they were able to do that was by, by the mainstream media's um, beautifully orchestrated fear campaigns so that we're all in this reactionary place. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And the most locked down cities of the world are the most vaccinated mm. cities in the world yeah. and the most injured cities in the world. Mm. A friend of mine sent me a poster from uh, Cape York um, saying, Pfizer pool party, kids come and grab your free soft drink, your, mm. your, um, your sausage and, 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 and come and join our big rubber pool that we're going to blow up. And mm. yeah. Blatant manipulation of children who were not at all by any scientific measurement mm. at danger mm. that poster really shocked me it, it was it had completely thrown out informed consent um and mm. it at, you know to get back to what you're saying about your or your um your family member saying why are we at the front of the queue? And mm. why are we hearing um, mm. the most vulnerable people in Australia, particularly Aboriginal people? We need to get them jabby jabbied up. What, what the voices in Indigenous Australia were outside of the mm. accepted narrative that was allowed through. Because everywhere yeah. I heard was that you're either being captured you're an Aboriginal person being captured by conspiracy theories or you're an Aboriginal person following the government line, yeah. which is the correct thing to do. Recently, Tyson Young Porter wrote a thing about being blackpilled in the ABC, um, uh, ABC Online. And he was you know, really drawing attention to the problem of conspiracy theories in Aboriginal communities. And I... I I questioned Tyson on that and, and said, well, you know, to me, the mainstream media is far more dangerous than some fringe conspiracy theorists. Yes, maybe started in America. That's intersecting in marginal groups all over the world. Those who don't feel heard. Mm. Um, because, because it's mainstream media is systemic mm. Mm. and it's, being uncritiqued and it's power that is being uncritiqued mm. so just to I mean I really want to move on to the custodial aspect of yeah talk, well bringing but, bringing that custodial <clears throat> notion in I think and following from what you just said I think if we look in the last five to ten years in what I perceive is is, is a significant shift in Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islanders people response to in the in the creative arts and how that space goes through such structured interference mm. is is art something that is responsive and we can rest with that or is art something that has an expert expectational element to it and in the creative arts industry where you see Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander people's um, engagement I think we can reflect through many of those artists on where people's vast and differing perspectives of all matters of choice, all subject matters, whether they be based in health, education, science, history, mm. the arts are something that we try too much and the scene set to control and yet the prolific 
number of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who um, are wanting to really bring f to the forefront those positions in that space. Um, do we have... Do you mean alternative narratives? Alternative narratives, mm -hmm. but more importantly, I wouldn't... I would say say it's it's just their way of being. Mm. I I sometimes feel that we can so overly complicate mm. understanding an individual, understanding a a group or a collective mm. by just too many words, too yeah. much about yeah. these are my expectations of what I want want to hear from you, as opposed to. I'm, I'm, I would welcome engagement just to actually do some deep listening and hearing and I'll just rest with it mm. and actually have that actual skill, skill base to be able to be respectful of time, space, mm. journey and the culture. And remember, culture is an ever-evolving notion. Mm. The land holds the, our culture. We're only agents of that culture our means of response is human. It's not land-based or culture-based in that sense. Mm. And so I would love for there to be a more um, recognised approach where an answer of it is just our way of being or our way mm. of doing, that doesn't need, in my mind, doesn't need to be any more questioning. Yeah. Yeah. But I find yeah. that that is something yeah. that leads many people, including myself, to overthink in a, in the mindset possibly of, I'm, I'm sort of like peddling away here, justifying, justifying, justifying. But in actual fact, it's yeah. just simple. It's mm. just the way it is. Mm. It is just my way or our way of being. Mm. And I accept then that the, from that state, there's an, eth <coughs> there's an ethics situation that you create where there's the the respect for each other mm. there's the caring there's the sharing and there's the people aspect mm. but engaging at those levels and actually having those conversations and sharing those situational things i think will will actually give a better grounding and honesty to the space yeah. at the moment i feel that the vast majority of aboriginal people yeah. um are very unheard by even their local community. Mm. Um, <coughs> Particularly organisations, you know, organisations like Aboriginal Medical Services, mm. uh, for example, you know, that they're... That are overseen by white institutions. Yeah. They're, well, they're, they're funded through Commonwealth and state yeah. funding, mm. and that funding determines what they should be doing without them saying, well, hang on, this is the black fellow way of doing thing, and not the government is, way, yeah. mm. you know, but they're tied into, mm. you know, key performance indicators that require them to report against that funding. Mm. So they've got to do it the government way. And they're the, you know, they're the, the, the impetus for the coercion mm. of communities, yeah. you know, and, and that comes from Commonwealth and state levels of government you know putting it down there and then them being the you know those organizations being the you know um uh the ones that are going out and saying you must do this you know mm. um for the good of everyone for the safety of everyone you've got to do this yeah which you know in colonial and decol decolonizing like types mm. of thinking i think you know to decolonize would actually be to increase custodianship, mm. to c increase the opportunities mm. of people to be custodians mm. of, of their own mm. um, uh, lands, of their own spaces and places. Mm. It also would, is, you know, the decolonising has to be about people's increased health and wellbeing. And mm. I think by actually giving that space the respect and time that it is, mm. is warranted, because that actually is the health and well-being of country and is, in my mind, going back to our custodial mm. responsibilities. Yeah. Mm. And in this last three-year period, I 
I, I can't see a mainstream nar narrative talking in that context that our reaction that we've experienced even gave consideration to mm. increased custodianship mm. and increased health and well-being in an overall mm. Uh, mm. picture. I can see that the health and well-being reaction was reactionary in relation to fear of death and you know um, things of that nature but I can't see that the reaction in the last three years had any notion of thought to connect that to custodianship to connect that to people's and, health and, and well -being. it's a disconnect too because yeah. it, it, you've got a reductive materialistic dominant culture yeah. imposing itself on a sacred mythic land cultural based set of communities mm -hmm. and then white institutions giving lip service to the sanctity and sacredness mm -hmm. of country mm -hmm. and the sanctity and sacredness of eldership and aboriginal heritage and mm -hmm. continued culture without having a cultural mechanism to actually understand it so that when something like COVID happens and it's top down and it's WHO and American CDC and FDA mm. imposed their indigenous wisdom, life ways, cosmology, customary mm. sovereignty just right. goes out the window That's right. and every other minor cultural community is also affected in yeah. that way and so what I think COVID has really shown non-Indigenous families like ourselves is what it is to be in a contagion class. Mm. To, therefore, the, the horrors of that, but also the connections to Aboriginal friends and families mm. and communities that we've been able to deepen because we understand that more mm. closely. It's only a short period of time. Mm. But it, it's given us a, an insight yeah. into how colonialism works where the majority does not see it colonialism. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the thing that's really awoken me is just the, the deep-seated and embodied colonialism in all of our in organizations mm -hmm. and structures, mm -hmm. particularly the public ones. Mm -hmm. I, I really connect to what you're saying about household and community and um, and local place mm. connection is fundamental. The integrity of those relations are fundamental. Yep. Mm. Um, however, big imposing bureaucracies and institutions and now even global institutions with the pandemic treaty, mm -hmm. the WHO pandemic treaty pretty much for drawn conclusion undemocratically yeah. <laughs> pushed through in in countries like this, mm. um, while we will continue to have that integrity, mm. there is this structure that has learnt a lot, mm. yeah. and and what it has learnt is how to how to use fear to control. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And mm. and and therefore, what is coming? Mm. Yeah. Without us constantly obsessing about that, because we need to stay present and clear and relational. Yeah. But there is a tendency, especially in myself, to continue to think, "Wow, what's next?" Mm. Yeah, and, and what... I, I think in the, in um, in many ways, what has evolved is is actually to almost deny, but particularly to not focus on generally speaking and not just from an Aboriginal perspective but not to reflect on your lived experience mm. to not rely solidly on your existence of past whether that be your individual past or whether that be our, your ancestral past I, I feel that there's been a real collective agenda to remove that that natured way of people which we all know as, as where whether we're an indigenous um, race of people historically 
But in our particular contemporary circumstance, I feel that there are very few people who are actually allowing themselves the space, probably, I assume, because they're being deconditioned to actually do so. But there, there isn't that space of time and connection to place where people can actually sit with the before, mm. in, in the with, mm. for the actual after. And it's not something that is a practice. And I suppose if we look at it and relate it to meditation, mm. we, we all, those that have practiced meditation, mm. will actually understand that the package that you have to have, you know, the yesterday, the with, the now, and, mm. and the after, to actually, you know, be present. Mm. And I think there's been that deconditioning of mm. um, almost in a, in a way of which some of our skill set, our tools or our... Even if you looked at it as color, mm. and you said said to yourself, "I can't see as much people bringing a colorful palette mm. into the with meaning the now." Mm. And so, are we losing the joy of being able to relate lots of different aspects of color mm. into into things, and just defining things as red mm-hmm. or yellow mm-hmm. in the sense of there isn't an openness mm-hmm. to a large palette yeah. and that's cut off the past or the before yeah. and I often say to our children when situations prevail where you need to have some open discourse and narrative about what's happened mm-hmm. take for example, um, having a conversation with one of our teenage daughters um, many years ago when she was responding to a teacher librarian at her, at her school about being told that she couldn't borrow a particular um, novel from the library because it was age inappropriate. We chose to have the conversation with her, allowing her to present her case in a structured narrative of argument to us why she believed that the teacher librarian had made a misjudgment on her as an individual instead Mm. of a collective Mm. about whether a particular uh, novel was inappropriate and you can't borrow that because you're in class such and such and we don't allow class such and such students to borrow that particular Mm. book. And what she presented to us was strong, well-argued, and she brought into that her presentation of narrative her past learnings that gave her a grounded footing to argue the, the now or the with Mm. And then also reflected that it's not to say that I'll only read this book once. I'll Mm. probably read it again when I'm older. Mm. And so we worked that way as opposed to perhaps Mm. just agreeing with the teacher librarian. Mm. And our response to that was, after we had heard her, was to offer her, instead of borrowing the book from the school library, Mm. was to, would you you like us to buy you the book? Mm. And we had ex- we experienced in our mind that mm. she had strong enough yeah. feet of her own to stand, and not to not to actually be disrespectful. Mm. She wanted to be heard. She mm. wanted to bring with her what had happened before that yeah. gave her that. Yeah. Mm. sense of well this is me this is actually my decision mm. I'll take on board what you what you as my parents think mm. and in response to that was was us actually saying to her if you feel that this is something that you wish to do mm. we're here to support that at any given time if you would we purchase the book that you choose to cease reading the book or you want you know us to read the book with you you know, they were all options. Whereas I saw the reaction of the teacher librarian to be generic. It didn't bring into context what past she had. 
she was she wasn't given a individual approach she wasn't respected for being it, it, uh, an individual she was just part of this growth of collective that we can we can mm. then subject to mm. imposition yeah so mm. I it was just then the bigger the collective the imposition is easier yeah um, and and disregard mm. the individual to be subjected to the fear and the coercion and mm. to be distanced away from for particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to to not have country and to not have connection and the issues around custodianship and the issues around continuity of culture, culture being held by the land, us as agents of that culture, that was not part of the discourse about the, yeah. the reactions. Mm. And how do we, I think, there's a, there's a sense in, my, in me now, how do we actually bring about that now how, mm. how how do we in this contemporary space now respond to that yeah how do we have conversations with mm. our own people with with our others and all people about custodianship mm. how do we how do we navigate talking about the gift of land the role of land in our lives the role of land in our culture when we've seen this massive wave of everybody's got to move together. I don't see that there's a need to fear wildness mm. if we have mm. our past and our with now and looking towards the future in a readiness state to be able to actually embrace that. Mm. I feel like we've now told or imposed that you shouldn't experience fear or suffering. Mm. It's like in death I see the in so many spaces, the removal of the actual process of being connected to the to the actual passing of a loved one, mm. and it's like shopping at a convenience store. The actual passing of a person as a loved one, you can almost absconce yourself from all responsibility mm. of death. Mm. You can be removed from physically seeing death. Mm. You can be removed from preparation and time with a past person. Yeah. You can even have another space that's disconnected to your relational um, place deal with the bodily parts of passing. Mm. So that you can actually go through a process of what we we understand as mm. grieving in, and a, a type of a, a cultural means of processing that passing you can actually be now consciously removed or unconsciously removed from it in total mm. and I think that's another aspect of disconnection to country and space that mm. contemporary people are experiencing mm. the notion of removing that from people and mm. the conformed way in which we can only do these things just mm. as a specific more specific example of that conditioning of there's there's one way and one way only yeah. and how how much of culture for all people all peoples are we losing mm -hmm. by that disconnection yeah. of yeah. custodianship of not taking our role and responsibility as custodians mm -hmm. as our ancestors did in in your utopian vision for mm -hmm. a kind of uh, re-indigenizing of culture and land in in Australia with people from all over the world here now mm -hmm. like what no. What, what's required of, of us? You know, respecting obviously of that, uh, that land, you know, that country, mm. and ensuring that whoever may have been from that in the past is still part of it, still seen as part of that land. Mm. If it becomes a, a, a farmland, then, you know, how could it be shared? Mm. You know, mm. not in the sense of. Um, you know, come and live on it. I mean, that would be ideal for some some people if if mm. they had that clear connection to a particular part of land, especially if it's uh, large pockets of land. So why not 
you know, utilise some of that for those who, yeah. you know, have a um, uh, a deeper connection to it through their ancestral links. Yeah. Mm. Food sources, obviously, is something that, you know, when we talk about Aboriginal communities in uh, isolated areas, mm. Mm. food and water is a real problem. Mm. And the the access to it is, is always hard to <clears throat> have even the local governments or so on, you know, still have restrictions around uh, mm. certain things. Governments have a responsibility to start to free up some of those restrictions and there are large landowners that have resources that could be shared, yeah. should be yeah. sharing them. Yeah. It's a simple it process. It almost seems there's more possibility in the private space for connection and relationship mm. and opening that up than the heavily bureaucratised um, institutional spaces. Yeah. Well, that's right. It's so sad to see a native title determination that has part of that determination um, a numbered system where the um, then declared um, claim, successful claimants, un because the land's already leased or freehold, that those peoples can only on certain dates of the year mm. conduct a one-off ceremony annually mm. or once once a year collect ochre. Mm. I mean, if we were to remove the material thoughts of land, mm. to remove the what should be removed in, in, in the way I, I would really like to see a, a growing number of people gather and collect in a mindset where it's actually just about respect and share and care. Mm. So it's, you remove the material monetary side of it and you actually look at what 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 actual responsibilities do we have in relation to respect for country land our connection to so we can break up the words we can separate them and put them into different contexts different phrases mm. sentences but the reality is connection to country is an unbroken system. Mm. No matter what we look at that has been the impacts of colonisation yeah. this, on this continent, yeah. we can still mm. very easily determine, define and be akin to the connection to country yeah. mm. as an existence of being. But without bringing in and, and evolving um, ourselves to respect and share and care, to care enough to remove the material nature of being able to see someone else's request as a legitimate reasoning to maintain connection. Mm. Mm. To be able to see that a, our, in a person who's in a private free, you know, a freehold situation, and this might even be an Aboriginal land council, that under determination has has received crown lands back. Mm. There's no denial in my mind that that process is is based on an attempt, a very small attempt to heal. Mm. That's not. Ta I'm, I don't want to take mm. it any further than the notion of healing because it mm. heals people and it heals country. Mm. So decolonize it by healing, but then we also need to be mature enough to even say to ourselves that. As freehold um, title people, um, Aboriginal people, we, we need to look at, again, going back to the system that remains unbroken, that, that needs healing. Mm. How do we heal those spaces? Mm. How do we heal a colonised space, even with native title or with land rights in New mm. South Wales? Mm. What are our obligations at an Aboriginal land council um, level to heal that space? Mm. Many will say that the land is returned as sort of just compensation to process, yeah. but we remove ourselves from that from the material notion of that process. Yeah. How do we ensure that we heal and regenerate yeah. our connection to country that is actually a system that remains unbroken? Yeah. We are choosing by our actions to deny our involvement in that system. The system goes on. Yeah. Yeah. The system is so ancient 
that it is always there. It rests in the land. It's it's it's, it's like language. Yeah. The revitalization of language mm. is is always the land holds that language. Yeah. The land holds those stories. The mm. gifts of people to revitalize that process and reaction it and re-engage with it mm. is what heals things. And I think we need a vast amount of maturity mm. collectively to actually be able to put that at the forefront. And this is the challenge, isn't it? It's a, a huge in a, challenge. In a grossly narcissistic, dominant culture, mm. we need maturity. Yeah. And that's to draw back on something you talked about earlier uh, about is it my Myra's story with the book? Yeah, so that giving her agency in that um, situation, her stepping into that, but at the same time being the adult and, and showing her what a mature adult response is, whereas what we have now is a, a, a dominant mm. cultural paradigm where it's giving all this power to children mm. and that any kind of mature response that has a authority over children's um, anything. Anything yeah. is yeah. is kind of seen as right wing or uh, mm. um, you know outmoded, while at the same time being a highly compliant culture. Mm. So yeah. like it, it's this sort of culture that's got conflict kind of flipped it. It's not witnessing the child where they are and raising their yeah. feelings of empowerment mm. uh, and and being witnessed in the family and the community. That's right. I don't want to feel as though I'm imposing that disempowerment on a child of ours or any other child that we've been gifted mm. um, some caregiving to because over the years we've we've cared, cared for many other children who aren't ours mm. um, for varying times. But the, I think that the injustice of, of not allowing that child to actually grow into themselves as opposed to being conditioned into a space in 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 into a pillar mm. is mm. is very detrimental for all of us not mm. just the child's yeah. journey okay. but it is removing our actual eldership role yeah. our eldership role is isn't dictatorial yeah. our eldership exactly. role is to actually yeah. really hear and listen yeah. because mm. I think truly believe that that whole process of a child or anyone being truly heard mm. gives understanding. The understanding doesn't have to be reactionary and I think in a poor situation the understanding is reactionary mm. because you're looking for a quick fix solution to an immediate problem. We mm. perceive it as a problem but that hearing leading to understanding. In my mind, understanding is a notion evolves mm. and it might might not be tomorrow, it might not be, you know, next week. But we all need to become better practised at just mm. sitting with things. Mm. Sitting with and de- and you know, having heard and deeply thought, we then gain our knowledge. And we we do that no matter how old we are. Mm. No matter yeah. what our experiences yeah have been mm. and the severity of our experiences I think is a monumental input and if we don't allow ourselves children as well as um, adults those those issues of wrong way mm. experiencing wrong way naturally experiencing it and actually having to retrieve the wrong way as a form of growth mm. we are so then prone to actually being conformed yeah. mm. we are allowing ourselves to be conformed we are allowing our children to be conformed yeah. by not actually mm. processing wrong way as a learning experience yeah. beautiful beautifully yeah. said I, I'm going back to the process you took us uh, and the students at the PDC yesterday through and just the incredible transformation that was already happening in those students th- three or four days in but at the end of your session there was just this beautiful softening in the circle I'd like to hear from both of you before we close just some of the joy and some of the healing that you are seeing 
and some of the experiences that you feel right now very alive to in terms of the possibility for you and your family and your broader community. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, um, that's pretty big mm. and this, in the sense of who do you speak for, I think. Mm. Um, being, a, being a partner and being a parent in a um, and in relationship with each other, um, we grow on that every day. Mm. Um, our relational way of being, I think, is is joyous. Not to say that life doesn't give you hardship, but I think that we're at a really good space as partners and as carers of each other and um, our extended family and community, that acceptance of harshness actually brings joy mm. because it allows you to differentiate. It allows you to see where beneficial work can be done, whether it's individual or collective. And, it's, and it can be joyful. Mm. Removing yourself from the chaos of things that, through wisdom, you know that you really don't have control over. Mm. And refocusing your energy into simplicity, beauty, joy, and particularly the most significant thing of, of closeness, mm. of being able to nurture, to be in receipt of nurturing, to, to experience love and happiness and joy. Mm. Without that, I think our ways of seeing and being are restricted. Mm. So we're only mm. somewhat of what we could potentially be. Mm. And so joy for me and hope are things, are things of that nature. Mm. My hope rests in the way in which my children and grandchildren currently are actually imprinting themselves what they're leaving for others to consider mm. their simple ways of actually signaling signaling who they are mm. what it means to be them and that those that choose to hear and see them are uh, i live in hope that that is something of greatness mm. something of of joy mm and wonder and I just really hope with my with, with the hope that I have I hope that we we can always look on every every day instead of what just what is but what if like what if we look at things what if we did, had done this differently tomorrow if we do this differently so being availed that space, being availed that respect to each other mm. is where I'll leave that, I think. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we were looking at the conversations that we had with um, uh, the group yesterday and from the beginning, I suppose, you could think that from our perspective it could in some ways, and it was... Uh, throughout it sort of a history lesson mm. that some knew or were hearing for the first time and sharing the knowledge and the experiences that we've had over a long time mm. and then seeing at the end of it the emotions <clears throat> that it surfaced but also trying to you know thinking about how do they and what we wanted to do was for them to apply what what we were talking about to their own experiences. How how are they going to connect with country wherever they might be living or or working? How are they going to connect with the people who might be from that country or you know Aboriginal people who who live by? Um, so. I think for for me, it's the benefit is sharing our experiences and having that experience and that that learning accepted, mm -hmm. taken on, 
and maybe those experiences and the learnings will then be passed on to passed on through their work through caring and nurturing the uh, the land uh, but also learning more and sharing it with family or with the broader community what we learnt over many years we want our children to continue that legacy mm. you know we want them to be able to be proud of who they are where they're from um, not just you know their parents but their grandparents and uh, and I'd like to think you know they would have a deeper understanding of their ancestral links mm. so I, I guess you know for me it's I, I, I think now we're at a point of time where we can do that sharing of our experiences and feel good about it mm. and knowing that it's something that's worthwhile and and somebody's actually listening mm. Mm. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Always You're a, welcome. Always a pleasure to, to chat with you guys. Yeah. And we've got another day of it, which is yes. I'm looking forward to. Me too. <laughs> Old bird, you and I are brothers, bonded by earth and wood. Old crow, you and I are sisters, swimming in a bowl of blood. Old friend, you and I were strangers Living by a restless sea Friend, I knew when the wind blew That you were calling me And we bought our time And we shared our skills And we shake our bones Sink like a stone And we cross through mud Till we reach the sky And we bide our time And we bide our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like a stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky we bide our time And we bide our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky And we bide our time <laughs>